Well, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to another installment of Show to Be with Mike G, the show of life, the show of Scotland, the show of art, a career in whiskey, and so much more. I am so happy to finally bring this chat with you today. We speak with the legendary man himself, the nose, Mr. Richard Patterson of the Dalmore, a man that is so lauded in the scotch industry. His 50 plus year career with White Mackay is a massive one, and he's a brilliant gentleman. I recently sat down with Richard right before his Seven Grand Whiskey Society chat downtown, and what an experience it was being guided through an amazing glass of Dalmore with the man himself. A legendary experience, and thank you so much, Sean Tapia, for making this all happen. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this great chat with the master himself, Mr. Richard Patterson. Well, it is, but I like to I like to arrive. I like to arrive knowing that I've got all my props. Yeah. But I'm still fiddling around with getting it out my case and hoping that it, everything's going to work, you know, right. like uh, Josh has to set up the uh, equipment and everything. So we were very lucky. We got most of it, but it, I'd rather walk into a room or wait for the people knowing that they've arrived and the equipment's working. Just what, what you've just mentioned just That's now. That's the irony, right? Yeah. I'm frantically trying to yeah. get technology to work where we just need our mise en place that's right, right. yeah you just want everything in a perfect but, order you know uh, i mean e- even something small was changing you know the, the sort of slide things it was so sensitive you just had to tap it and it moved but if you tapped it too much it would you know moved along three times you it's know, hard so. to just adjust like that yeah. but this is a great opportunity for me and i think for a lot of people to kind of hear about what is over a 50-year career in whiskey so one, you're still alive. Still alive. Two, you're not that gray. And three, you still have a relatively nice head of hair and a smile on your face. Thanks very much. It so, made my day. <laughs> <laughs> but you, in a few years, you're born in 1949, if I understand. That's correct, yes. Just a few years younger than my father, who recently transitioned into 70, 71, actually. Right. Is that a mile marker for you? 50 years has to be, but is 70 a moment where you may hang it up? Uh, not really. Uh, I, I mean, obviously, I'd love to do uh, longer, but, you know, I've said that I would do, uh, I'm coming up to 51 years and 50 years with the White Mackay Company. But uh, obviously, you can't overstep your mark. So I've got other projects in the go, but, you know, hanging out on boots would be too definite. I like to still think I can do other things connected with the whiskey industry. So that's what I'm partially looking at. But what I'm doing just now is laying the foundations with some of the finishes, some of the aging processes that will remain uh, a sort of legacy, if you want to put it that way, yeah. for 10, 15 years' time. It's nice to have a legacy. Well, Did you when, you, when you were a younger man, because I think this starts in 1970, is that when you kind of came into Yeah, that's right. A long yes. time ago, right? Yeah. Did, when you think about the concept of a legacy or leaving a history, because you've been doing this, you've, you're an author, I mean, there's, there's a shit ton of stuff you've done, right? Did you even have the notion that it would become something so big and so long? No, it's a very good question, actually, because uh, when I started with my father, you know, when I started, I was eight years old, and then when I came into the industry, really in 1966, it was still a sort of cloak of dagger. Yeah. It was very much, uh, you couldn't talk to the other blender of another company. You couldn't even communicate with somebody else. No women were allowed in the sample room. Everything was very private. The big companies kept to themselves, and there was no exchanging So really, you know, these things have sort of come to pass. They've changed dramatically. One of the biggest changes was in 1997 when uh, the Whiskey Frankfurt uh, Festival started and New York followed one year later. And every year since then has brought greater awareness, not just to blended whiskies, but particular single malts. Now, blended whiskies are still 90%, 91% of the whiskey market. But the rising fame of single malts because the consumer is now becoming far more discerning. If I turned up at a whiskey festival today with a Dalmore 20, uh, well, 
dumb or 12 year old really and a juror 12 or 10 years old they'd kill me because they're now looking for <laughs> something different and when we look at the Dalmore King Alexander when we look at the 21 the 30 the 40 the 45 these are expressions that are different from the rest and that keeps the inspiration and the amusement to some degree of the consumer out there what about even a further extension of this category and that is mixing scotch Using it in cocktails, how do you feel about that? Co- cocktails, I, I don't really care. Yeah. When it, when it comes to you know mixologists today using whiskey, I'm all for it sure. uh, because they themselves are like master blenders, like myself. They're doing their cocktails, which is an enhancement of their uh, experience. But actually, the whiskey will be part of it. But then you don't discriminate between the cocktail. When you do a really great whiskey cocktail, is there whiskey in it? Or is there orange or is there sherry or is there something else? That's the mystery and that's the attraction of a cocktail. So I'm all for it. But I hope perhaps when it's mixed with our single malt or even our blended whiskies, they say, wait a minute, let me try this on its own. And then trying it on its own, no ice, no anything. Just look look at it, take it straight. Does this style suit me? And then trying to diverse from there. Isolate the track. Hear the lead vocal on its own. This is how I look at it. And I think that's a good way to look at it. And it expanded, evolved yes. category. You know, I'm curious, again, having such a very long career in this industry, third generation? Third generation, that's right, yes. Was there a point in which you would have ever done something else? Uh, I, I looked at, well, I looked at hotel management for, for a number of years, and I actually worked in the hotel industry. But what I found was that I was actually being subservient to the customer. I was trying to teach them, you know, and look after them, where I wanted to be actually part of that product yeah so when my father offered me the opportunity to you know take this job um i sort of jumped at it but then what was sad about it was people used to say well let's face it richard back in 1966 you only got this because of your father Ah. and that annoyed me intensely and that's why i studied wines for 15 years uh looking and taking examinations and then traveling and then going to different countries and now that's paid because now with the whiskies that I produce, I go to these countries that I saw the wines, Cabernet, you know, Madeira, Marsala, right. Port, and they're part of my life now. And part of my life is enhanced, allow me to enhance these whiskies. The element of learning here, because when you talk about expanding your mind to wines and traveling, even though you've probably seen a lot and been in a lot of different places, the element of learning, how important is that to you oh, now? That, that, that is a very good question. As soon as you say that name, learning, education, I start getting bristles in my hairs, you know, <laughs> my arms here, because that's what it's all about. I go by two things, knowledge is power, and when the executive stops learning, he's finished. But it is about education. All my trips here to America is about education, yeah. but it's an education in a particular way. Now, I don't make any bones about it when my doing my presentations they are different they're violent in a certain way i throw whiskey all over the place i throw ice. visceral <laughs> yeah but because you've got to get their attention you've got to say now this is not just any single malt you must give it the reverence you must hold it in your mouth for 10 15 20 seconds yeah. and people say what you, you you hold it in your mouth for that length of time yes because if you're going to enjoy a dish of food you don't swallow the food you chew it the more you chew it the more you extract the flavors and that's exactly the same with all our whiskies whether it be Dalmore 12 King Alexander but when it gets to the 25 the 30 the 35 the 40 the 45 the yeah. 50 and the 64 these need reverence they need the time to show what age has brought to it yeah I think of that visceral and there's been many things said about the way in which you taste whiskey whiskey the way in which you advise people to taste whiskey yeah. But the learning process, and rather you as a teacher, were you a rebellious guy? Did you grow into this narrative and says, I don't like, I want to be more counterculture, revolutionary, innovator? Is that something that you've embraced as uh, part of this I, I stuff? Thought, I think it's from experience. I mean, no mistake, when I, when I did my first uh, whiskey presentation way back in 1968, down in a, a place called Campbellton on the, the west coast of Scotland, you know, how did the first presentation go? I was being sick all the time in the, the toilet. I, every presentation that I did after that, I was being more sick. It was, it was, I was so nervous about it. But then slowly but surely, I then picked up some of the attributes, some of the things, some of the skills, and then I've sort of taken it from there. But then what I quickly realized is 
We need to stimulate our audience here. They don't just want a whiskey. They want facts. They yeah. want historical. They want to be entertained, especially in Scotland. If you're going to do a presentation, you've got to entertain these guys. Otherwise, they'll kill you. So, you know, <laughs> that's that's what I had to do. And I've changed. I mean, uh, Josh, who's been with me on many, many occasions, will know that every time I do a presentation, it's different every time. Yeah. There are certain elements I bring in. But, I mean, when we arrive here in beautiful Austin, you know, I immediately think, oh, wait a minute, Dalmore Distillery established 1839. Austin becomes the capital of Texas 1839. Amazing. You know, all these things that have to be integrated. So before I go on a trip, I'm looking to see how many miles it is, 4,348 to Dalmore. What is behind the history? Yeah. Is there something that can be linked with the whiskey? Because all these links, whether it be art, history, or anything, this is the sort of knowledge that I try and bring in. Uh, not everybody remembers it because a lot of people move around in, in the United States, but it's a lot, it's part of it to show you Scotch is very much part of the world today. Outside, because this very unique teaching style, it's not spontaneous necessarily. You've spent these years kind of crafting and honing in your ability to connect with audiences, expanding out to art, and people that create, whether it's music, film. Yeah. What are what are some areas or some people you've mentioned Pollock before that yes. you find that they inspire you to create in a different yeah. way? Yeah. Yeah. These are good questions, by the way. I must thank, thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, the, the uh, art has been very important to me. You, you mentioned about Jackson Pollock, 1949, 1951, creating. A, a, literally different paintings, drip painting, yeah. which nobody Perilous could Night, understand. I think is, a, is an amazing piece. Yeah. Totally out of style for him too. But then, but then people used to say to him, what is it? This is a mess. And they said, no, it's not. Just look at it. And when you look at my paintings, it will open up and you'll see the very soul of it. It's the soul of the whiskey, same as the soul of the painting. But then when we go to the Dalmore, 25 years old, uh, that was inspired through Paul Cézanne, the painter of mm. France. He was born on the uh, 19th of December, 1839. What's he famous for? Three-dimensional paintings. Well, Dalmore 25 is three-dimensional, being American White Oak, Palomino Fino, and, of course, Port. Mm. And, of course, what did we do? We launched it in Cannes. And luckily, when we, the day we launched it was the death of uh, Paul Cézanne, 22nd of October, 1906. Really? So that's a whole story, a, a crafting of painting and the painting of the preparation of the Dalmore 25. It feels like so there's always got to be some sort of story in that. Yeah, like an undercurrent of art. That Maybe yeah. that's the spark of inspiration for yeah. you. You're very much in the public eye. You've got books and there's many interviews, of course, podcasts like this. Do you feel like people know who you actually are? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, it'd be nice to say, oh, I'm the biggest, greatest whiskey blender in the world and all this. But, I mean, come on, let's be serious here. I share my blending skills with many other great blenders, and I work with so many great people, but I'm part of a team more than anything. Yeah. I mean, I cannot do my job unless I've got Margaret in, uh, who works beside me. She's been with me for, you know, 40 years. We've got people up at the distilleries and the analysis people, the people at the bottling and blending complexes. So it's very much part of it. But I, I like to think that, you know, some people will remember me, but to say that everybody is just, you know. It's a little I, overreaching, pie, perhaps. Overreaching, pie in the sky, yeah. Do you, have you built a family over these decades? Yeah, I've got, I've, I've obviously got uh, two sons and a daughter, and, um, you know, uh, they're, they're great children. But I thought perhaps my daughter at one point might have come into the whiskey industry, yeah. but it wasn't to be. And uh, they, But they've chosen their own, and I would never have done it any other way. They've chosen their course. I've chosen mine. If it, they don't come into the whiskey, but as long as they can look at things like whiskey and wine and perhaps appreciate it more, that's what I've always tried to show them and tried to teach them. I think that's a great thing. I've talked to a lot of tequila producers yeah. that have been in the family for generations. Right. And I always ask them, I said, did your dad expect you to do this? And yes. Never, ever. No. If anyone said that, they said, no. My no. father always wanted me to go in my own way. Yeah. And it sounds like you stumbled upon whiskey in your own independent way. It, it, I actually, you know, you, it's uh, very important to me that my father taught me a lot. But when I was writing the book, um, I realized I hadn't actually talked to my father enough. And the other side to the coin was when I actually put it out for checking and checking and rechecking before I had it published, somebody came back and said, did you not love your mother? And I went, what do you mean by that? <laughs> 
I said, because you mentioned just your father, you don't mention about your mother. And actually, in fact, you know, it was like my job today. I travel a lot, and you've got to remember your partner and what have you, yeah. and don't forget them. Well, you know, my mother must have seen it with my father traveling and, you know, promoting whiskey as well. But uh, That's an So point. it's getting the balance right. You're often regarded as one of the finest noses in the industry. <laughs> Aesthetically, right? This is the saying, the length and the girth yeah. of the nose, right? Or rather, the abilities therein, right? Our memories are highly tied to smells, more than any other sense. Do you find that having such a vivid sense of smell that perhaps you remember things in a much more detailed manner, going back much longer than maybe I, other I'm, people? I'm not, I'm not totally convinced about that. And no. why I say that is it's really about passion. Mm. Um, if you were with me for a month and I was showing you whiskeys every day and showing you different concepts and then thinking about the smell when I walked in here, like I normally do, I s smell the room. It's part of my act to say, what's going on here? Is there body odor? Is there somebody there? Has there been a woman in here? We passed a woman there. And that, you know, you're smelling her. You just become conscious of it. But it's really transferring that and trying to deal with that passion of creating that maybe reflects some of these nuances that you remember. Mm. But you have to get to know the child originally. And what I mean by that is the single malt is a child, it's a baby that has to be nurtured, but has to be carefully looked after. What is compatible with this? Is this particular style of sherry wine compatible? That's why when I go to these presentations, I usually pick out, like last night, there was a beautiful lady called Jessica, and I said to her, oh, you look really great in purple. Is that your particular color? And she said, oh, I just love purple. Mm -hmm. And it makes her radiate in her own way. Well, we have to get dull more. We have to allow it to radiate with the right style of cask. And it's not always easy. Joe Public out there just think, oh, you just take a whiskey and you put it into sherry wood or bourbon and that's it. Yeah. No, that's just the beginning of it. It's an, it's an inspiration, a spark again, that kind of makes you think about it in different ways. Yeah. And I think that's a great piece of innovation that will continue to thrive in this industry. When we think of specific scents that you find completely un- appealing what are some things that you can really really in detail smell that you do not care for well i don't care for i, I don't know there's, there's there's certain acidic notes that hit the top mark you know you get uh, what we're always trying to create is citrus fruits in our dalmore citrus chocolate orange but then sometimes you can get these notes that are sort of foreign but they've come from casks that have not had full maturation yeah. or the casks have become quite tired uh, these are the most uh, rewarding ones when i go into the warehouse smell it and say well how are you getting on here oh no she's not ready she's going to go back into the warehouse we've never going to change her or do something so these acidic notes these ones that are what we call people would call sharp or yeah. acidic you know um we would just term terminology of being very dry stone or what have you yeah They've got to be nurtured in a particular way. But again, these are smells, nuances from experience. You think this is the next direction we're going to go. But it's still a mystery. Remember, when you put it into a cask, you hope it will go in this direction or yeah. that direction. And sometimes you've got to be very patient. It is a matter of patience, if nothing else. Good yeah. things do come from waiting. Yeah, time is, time is um, my time is my master. Master is, you know, what it's all about. You must give these whiskies time, time to mature, time to blend, time to put together, but then the consumer must be giving it time as well. Yeah. Well, we have this amazing event coming up here just in probably about 20 minutes. We have a tight schedule, which is good, and I want to respect that. You're going to be regaling us with the line of Dalmore talking about where it came from, tying it back to history now, which feels like maybe one of the lynch, the center points of your education in the way that you do that. So this is great. So tell me kind of, having not been in a room with you, seeing you present, what, what can I expect as a viewer, as a voyeur, if you will? I'd like you to, to see maybe for the first time of really relaxing tonight and seeing whiskey perhaps in a different light, perhaps looking in deeper you know, enthusiasm for single malts, to be aware of the work and the, what goes on at the distillery and to be aware of other things that are associated with the cask, where it comes from, 
the influence of, you know, the sherry wood from Gonzalez Bias, all these kind of things, but go away, may, maybe perhaps looking at whiskey and giving it a little bit more time than perhaps you didn't do in the past. Take a time to, uh, take some time out to stop and smell the roses yeah, in a sense. That is Be it. in the moment, right? Yeah. Do you yeah. think that people are losing that ability? <laughs> I no, already know the answer to this I th- in a sense. I think, but- I think, I think quite frankly that, the, the, as I said at the beginning, I think the consumer is becoming far more discerning. One thing to always never forget is when we talk about the food and mouth disease of uh, 1996, 1998, 2004, when something like 4.4 million cows had to be killed to stop this terrible you know, disease and everything. Well, people now say, well, wait a minute, I'm going to have some meat. How long has that meat been hung? Where does it come from? Where does this cast come from that makes up the whiskey? Mm. People are far more inquisitive, but they need to have the answers. Whatever you say on the label whether it be Dalmore, Jura, or White Mackay, it has to be correct, and it has to be no hoodwink. You mustn't confuse the consumer. Be clear. Articulate, yes. too. That's right. So I know that Sean has pulled some strings to bring a beautiful bottle here for, for us to talk about. Which of the line in the Dalmore is this that we're looking this, at? This is the Dalmore King Alexander, the only single malt in the world with six different finishes. Uh, this has been matured in Port, Madeira, Marsala, Cabernet Sauvignon, small batch bourbon, and Methuselah sherry. This is actually six separate assemblages that we put into the cask. We let the influence of what it held previously, whether it be the port, the wine, and allow it to take on its next fusion. Mm -hmm. And that fusion can take for the port five years, the Madeira Marsala, three years, the Cabernet, 18 months. And then we put them together in an assemblage and then allow it to marry together before we finally uh, bottle it. So I, hope that they, I hope we can always hear that cork noise. It's one of the most beautiful sounds. It is. But when, when, when we take this, there you go. <laughs> this, is the, this is the beautiful Copa Capita glass. It's shaped like a tulip, and this is the only glass, the only glass for assessing whiskey and cognac and wine. Yeah. Why? Because when I put it in my nose like that, you can see that I can't even get one fingernail actually in it Mm. it is completely blocked off and therefore when you when you pour it into the glass you know uh as you can see your glass is slightly different so you can take you can take that one there but when you pour it into the glass what you need to do is to make sure you can assess it well you know the first thing you must do is uh, swirl it down is what we do and then you throw it on the floor (laughs) Because when you put it on the floor... that was your jacket, Richard. (laughs) When you put it on the floor, when you put it on the floor, what you've done is now clean the glass completely, all right? But then what you you, mustn't do is ever hold the glass like this. You mustn't warm it like this. But what you must do is never nose it like this. You must put your nose right into it, say hello to it, then pull away, then go back to it and say, how are you? And then go back to it and say, quite well, Thank you very much. But you must do it slowly. If your eyes blink, that means you're nosing it too aggressively. But what you must do is be very comfortable, go back to it, go back to it, and then it will start to open up. And you'll see the top notes of chocolate, orange, cinnamon, spice, but then you'll see the influence of the port and everything else. What you smell is what you're going to get now. What you need to don't swallow it, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is to put it on the top of your tongue, Keep it there, 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 keep it there. Underneath your tongue, underneath your tongue, you'll see a little bit of spritzig, a bit of perignon, and then put it back up in the middle. Keep it there, really warming it up, warming it up, warming it up, warming it up, warming it up. Big deep breath, and then swallow, and then open your mouth. So wait for it. All these instructions. Yeah, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now you're going to see the Dalmore, the chocolate orange, the cinnamon, the spice, the marzipan. You're going to see hints of licorice. But then wait for it, wait for it. You're going to see these plummy notes coming in. And it's just going to slowly but surely drift away. But really, first taste is important. But it's the second taste. You need to go back it the second time because what you've had in your mouth before is something different. So really to get the full benefit of the flavor, just take a small amount in your mouth again. Here we go. Hold it there. That's it. All right. Just keep it there. 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 
and then just swallow it and this time just wait for it. Forget about your Chateau Lafitte, Latour, Margot, Hope, Brion. This is something that will go on and on and on. So just keep it there, keep it there, keep it there. Now it starts to really open up and it mm-hmm. starts to show its identity. So now you're looking at it. You haven't taken any water. You haven't taken any ice. This is at purposely at 40% alcohol. So it goes into the palate and now it's rewarding it. But this is for something after dinner. This is for something perhaps late at night so that you can talk about it and it can be part of your conversation. I feel like I just went through therapy in a sense, Richard. Well, you've, you've helped me. You've helped me work through some issues, right? But 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 what you should be doing is then thinking: Is this the best way? Well, give it to your guest. Yeah. You know, serve a creme brulee, then serve a coffee, Nicaragua, Java, Rwanda coffee, two mouthfuls of that. Then take your whiskey, hold it there, hold it there, let it go down. And then take a bit of chocolate, seventy-two percent cocoa fat. Mm. That will then combine with the whiskey, combine with the coffee, the creme brulee sensational beyond being intellectually peaked my appetite now is quite peaked thank you for that the chocolate notes i'm gonna have to get some to eat before this yeah. tasting now it's going to be a punch flight of dama there's a lot to enjoy this evening yeah but it's just even changing now as oh, you of course. speak yeah you i'm getting see, even almost salinity there's you can see of, lots of different things there definitely am well i know you've got a tight schedule and it's been a pleasure chatting with you i have one question for you left and before we head over enjoy some great scotch and punch at seven grand here in Austin. I'm going to take this history. Normally, I keep it pretty open when I ask this question of my guests, but it seems like you are very interested in history, and you use it as again a teaching mechanism, a way to tie people from the city and the state even to the spirit itself. Much like a band saying "Hello, Cleveland," right? Every night, it's the way to tie and bring the audience in. You are at any bar in the world, and you're sipping whatever scotch it may be that you're feeling right now. But you can have a conversation with any deceased historical figure. Who would you love to just sit there and ask about how they conquered the world? (laughs) Wow, that's a difficult one. Um, Obviously, people like Henry VIII is very uh, uh, in my my radar. Um, Sir Ernest Shackleton is another one, Elizabeth I of England. Um, you know, that there are just so Napoleon, Napoleon. you know, he, he wouldn't let you talk though. Well, He'd well overpower is, it the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> but there are so many and you know, uh, but that there, there, I don't know. So in Shackleton, I would love to talk to him and say, you know, why didn't you take uh, dogs instead of ponies and you know, what have you. And, but they, they've all got something to offer. That yeah. That's true. Do you still at this point in your career do you still sit down at the bar every now and again and have those really unique and enlightening conversations with people yeah i mean i mean uh, although i've been with josh for you know a number of years you know traveling around the world you know uh, especially america we, we we talk about lots of different things we were talking about kansas this morning and really th- these are things that sort of take my interest and the dust bowl and yeah. you know the prohibition 1920 to 1933 Things have really changed, and, and being America, being such a vast, vast country, you know, every city, every county, you name it, have, has got something to offer, whether it be the Civil War or what have you. Yeah. Th- there, there is just so many things. But again, what is a bit sad is quite a lot of people are not too interested in the past. I but I always think if you can't look at your past, then you can't look forward to your posterity in the future. Because it always repeats itself. Yeah, it History does. does. And that, that's, that's a very, you know, strong statement. And we've got that the wall in, in our company, you know, that very sta- statement by William Blake. And if you j- refuse to accept the past or even acknowledge it. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to be that surprised by the future. Let's go read a book. Yes. And find out what happens. That's right. <laughs> well, it's really been a, just an amazing experience to be guided through my glass of whiskey from the man who guides people through their glass right. of, of whiskey. We're going to head over to Seven Grand now, and it's going to be a great chat. And, you know, Richard, thank you so much for taking the time out. Thank you so much. Been awesome. Lovely experience. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. you. Well, there we have it. The Nose, Mr. Richard Patterson of the Dalmore, a man that is so heavily awarded, heavily respected, has a triumphant 50-plus year career in the scotch industry. And to sit down with the man and peek into his life, his dedication to scotch, his dedication to education and having him provide commentary through every tasting note of the scotch that was in my mouth at that moment is something I will never 
forget. It was an amazing experience for me, and this show affords me some lovely pleasures, and this is one of those things I will never forget. Again, thank you to Sean Tapia and Josh over at White and Mackay for making this happen. It was a lovely experience. I hope you guys are intrigued by the Dalmo. I hope you guys are intrigued by Richard's life and find that you had a little conduit into the man himself. So thanks, everybody, for listening to Show to V with Mike G. No matter how many episodes you have left of Scandal as it wraps its seventh season on ABC, or if you're thinking, man, I can't wait to see what the next crime drama will be on Netflix so I can binge yet again, please keep dancing. <laughs>